Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn. Before we get started with our incredible interview with John Fields, I wanted to come on and let you know we've got a new addition to our website, which is a voicemail feature where you can go onto the fromthewestbarn.com and hit leave us a voicemail. It's a little red banner on the side. You can click on it. We'd love to hear from you. Any of your questions, we're going to think about doing a questions and answers show. So if you have any questions for us, leave them there. If you have any comments about the podcast, we'd love to hear from you. We also have gotten, for one reason or another, we've got a big audience in India, and we'd love to know if you're from India listening to our podcast, how you came across it, and a little bit about you. That's it. Enjoy John Fields. This is a good one. See you next time. Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Shimshack. Today, our guest is legendary producer John Fields, multi-platinum producer, songwriter, mixer, multi-instrumentalist. He's worked with a ton of bands in multiple genres like Demi Lovato, Selena Gomez, Miley Cyrus, Pink, many other uh, pop acts, uh, Jonas Brothers, uh, Backstreet Boys, but also a lot of great rock bands, Switchfoot, Goo Goo Dolls, Lifehouse, goes on and on and on. Tons of great records. I recently, I'd been knowing John just through hearing his name and being like tangentially connected on records. There was a band out of Minneapolis that I had mixed a record for called Dropping Daylight that was one of my favorite bands ever. And as I mixed that record, I was listening to the uh, EP before that and just so envious of the sound. And the producer on that record and mixer was John Fields. Uh, he's a magic man, lots of great records, and he's had a long and productive career in the music business. We want to welcome to the show, welcome to the show, John Fields. Thank you very much, guys. And just to clarify, I did not produce, I just mixed That Dropping Daylight. Oh, okay. I uh, mean, that cool. was so good, that record. They were one of my favorite bands. Um, they were like Incubus meets Ben Folds 5, if you can imagine, Exactly, it was right? a piano-based rock band that, that just, with, with Sebastian's vocal, just soaring high notes and and they were from Minneapolis, which always, you know, for me, that gives you extra credit. Yep. So I was chasing them, chasing them. I was living in L.A. at the time, but I was chasing them down and and. Uh, it, I got to mix that one record, but I didn't get to produce the, the next record. That's too bad because I, well, I can remember thinking as I was listening, like, why isn't the guy who mixed this record and I'm, I was mixing it? <laughs> Right. You know, I'm like, well, why are they getting this guy to mix it? Because it was one of those frustrating situations where my mixes weren't as good as the mixes that you had. It's done just a question. You know, it's, it's so crazy. Uh, you never know what gigs you're going to get. And right. so you kind of take what comes and you hope that you can work with. You know, it's weird. It's like I have chased some bands and rarely does that work out. Right. That's so true. You want it so bad. I'm totally with you on that. And I was telling me and John were talking on the phone prior to the interview. And I was telling him I had done a record in New York that I had desperately wanted to do. And I had like submitted a bunch of stuff to the A&R guy and got rejected and then got hired to do that record from the production company that eventually got it. So it's like, it's, it's crazy. Some things you want to do just because you have a heartache for them. Right. And as songwriters and record producers, we have heartaches for projects. And sometimes you end up working on a record that, you know, somebody else wanted desperately, but you got, it's just, it's, I know, it's, it's, it's like, I've, I've been after, there's a band, one of my favorite bands of all time is Delamitri. Oh yeah. And I have tried, you know, through my manager, Frank, you know, contacting their managers. If you guys are ever, you know, they were disbanded for 20 years and actually they just made a new record that came out or that's about to come out. But, you know, back in the 90s and I had nothing going on and, you know, I was nobody. I just uh, I just loved the band. I wanted to work with them so bad. And of course, you know, it never it never happens. And but again, I'm just saying, Justin or Ian, if you're out there listening, I would love to work with you someday. Well, that's and, that's uh, a cool part but it, about you know, it probably never going to happen. And well, that's the cool part about what we do. It's like the money is secondary to being a part of great things, hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully. Right. I mean, I think it is for the, the three of us. Yeah, I know? mean, it's look, we've done thousands of projects. Right. And you're like, you know, how many of them are at that? Like, oh, my God, five top five percent level of talent and it's not just the talent and the, the songwriting and the sounds. And it's also the heat on the band or the artist at the time. It's the team behind them. Like, uh, I remember, you know, making the first Jonas Brothers record and thinking, OK, there is some heat behind this because it's, it's rare that you're making a record and that there's people like waiting for it mm -hmm. out there like fans. But this 
label, uh, Hollywood Records, was ready, you know, for us to finish. And it was really, a, it's a different feeling when you're in a studio when the, when there's great stuff happening for for that band or that artist at the time. And you're like, you know, as a producer engineer, generally you're you're not involved in those conversations, hearing like what's going on, the tour routing, or what opportunities are coming in. But you know. When you do hear it and it's good stuff, it's really exciting and it makes you think, wow, this is going to have an impact and it yeah. makes you, you know, bring your A game. Well, we were um, we were we just did a studio tour, which we'll link in the description to this of your facility there in Minneapolis. Um, but we were talking on the phone, you and I on Saturday, just a little bit in front of this. We were really talking about like what it takes now to be in the music business and like how maybe how the paradigm is shift, but like everyone will look to John Fields and they'll say, I want a career like that. Right. It's like, you're working on big, important records. You're working on things you believe in. You're going around the country. I just saw you on a Tim Pierce video with Tom Bukovac where you were making a record in LA, you know, so you're kind of living this jet setting rock, rock producer, writer, you know, you're, you're high in the ether of that world. It's like, what is, if somebody's starting off now, it's like, what is the worldview that you have? What got you to a place where that's the way your life is? A lot of people want to eventually get, they watch these videos because they want to get somewhere because they respect the lifestyle. You know, you're kind of saying, how do you do this? Um, I guess it's, it's what's your long, worldview. It's a long road. I mean, I can, I can tell you what I, what, what I remember as turning points for me. First of all, it was loving records as a kid and really sciencing in on them like you know doobie brothers rundgren xtc van halen beatles beach boys all of it and just going like what is that is that reverb and then i had this cool uncle steve living in minneapolis who was uh only 18 years older than me kind of young for having an uncle um and he knew the answers to those questions. So I would say, you know, what is that? Why, how do you do that? And he was also, I mean, shit, he was, when I was 11, Funky Town came out. So he was in studios and he would bring me in with him and show me. So and I'm sitting in a recording studio going, what's that? And he's like, that's a compressor. To give context, your, your uncle Steve wrote Funky Town, which was he wrote and produced of... and is the artist lip sync. So, so if you maybe one out, of the like biggest the song, songs of the century. It came out in the summer of 19 or it came out in 79, but it was number one for four weeks in America in 1980 in, in July. And it uh, as it was number one, number two was It's Coming Up by Paul McCartney. Number three was Another Brick in the Wall Part Two by Pink Floyd. Number four was Blondie Call Me. Number five was You're the Biggest Part of Me by Ambrosia. Wow. I mean, classic songs were staved off by funky town for four years I remember <laughs> uncle steve telling me later you know as and when i was an adult he's like i held off paul mccartney for four weeks at number one well i was Dude, number one and he was number two he definitely knows who i am he knows my band and my song which you know my uncle's the biggest beatles fan of them all so it was it was a really cool thing to have that a lot of people don't nobody has that where it's like somebody that you know well, they like, need that I think like, that's that's where I was yeah. hoping you were going with this, which was like, in order to get your worldview, I keep telling people that YouTube is a great place to learn a lot of things, but you can't learn a worldview about the way you see audio. So you need to find, I believe that if you're going to succeed and you become John Fields or Mike Shimshak, you've got to find somebody that you can just sort of admire, admire their work, and then hopefully get access, learn how they see the world of audio until you can get to a point where you have a concept and then you take it and build your own world. Right. You need a mentor. And I think your uncle was that to you. Yeah, he you... was. And and he got me into records that I would never have got been, you know, known about uh, Beach Boys, Surf's Up. You know, like he would send me Shaka Khan albums in 1979. And, you know, most kids were listening to ACDC and whatever, just Journey and... The regular and I, I love all that stuff, too. But he kept bringing me this like R&B funk side. And he essentially, you know, although I would say Lip Sync, it, it probably is a disco band, but it was kind of the end of the era. The records came out in 79, 80, 81, 82. And um, but before that, he was just a rock drummer. And this kind of goes back to like, what would how do you get here? Well, when I was uh, 18, 19, when I moved to Minneapolis, he was uh, this is the late 80s. 
he's he you know, he had had a successful before all this funky town stuff. He was basically in a wedding band, a successful wedding band here in in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And he hadn't played in a long time. And when I got here, he's like, I want to get the wedding band going again because he was already he wasn't retired, but he was done with lip sync, essentially. And he handed me the keys to his studio and he said, we're going to start the wedding band again. So you're playing guitar. And at that point, I was an OK guitar player, but not great. And he's like, here's the set list. Huey Lewis in the news, hip to be square, Sade, uh, Barbara Streisand, Hello, Dolly, you know, Motown medley, Neil Diamond medley, Beatle medley. Just uh, I'm so excited by the Pointer Sisters. So basically. Topical kind of current cover band, late 80s cover band playing at country clubs. So we did that for probably the first five years that I moved here. And I got to say that was the biggest school I've ever gotten on yeah. singing backgrounds. Learning three part harmony, like how to really do it without doubling someone else's note and all that. Um, kind of learning records from hit song construction, from listening to the yeah song construction. And then what do people dance to and how to make an ending that of a song that fades? And, you know, just <laughs> all these things that that, you know, live musicians have to do and have to figure out. And honestly, I really think that informed how I make records today. What do you think? So, like, what do you think your life would be like? We can't know. What do you think it would have been like without your uncle to give you? <laughs> so crazy. I, it's, I don't know. I mean, I mean you know, maybe I, there's I, I a version of this where you're just successful. But, you know, I, think I don't know that I'd be doing music. I honestly don't. I just don't think I would because my family wasn't necessarily. I mean, we list, you know, I had an older sister that was that got me into Steely Dan and, you know, Michael McDonald and stuff. But uh, my parents were not. And, and there was nobody in the neighborhood and there was, you know, nobody, no kids. And I grew up in Newton, Mass. And I don't know. There, I'm sure there were some musicians and stuff, but I didn't really know any. Well, so I, think- I, I it it changed everything to have this guy living in Minneapolis. And, and what, that, what what happened is as soon as I could, I wanted to move here. Mike, did you have someone in your life like that? I know I did. I've talked about him on the program, a mentor. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did not. My parents were very supportive. I have to admit, though, they were yeah. very supportive. But no, I'd probably but be much- you- say again. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. I'd be a much better musician um, if I had like what John had where, you know, like learn these parts and like, you know, everything I do is still on instinct. You know, um, I had a band, you know, we toured like crazy, but no, I, I guess I kind of figured it out a little bit on my own, but I would love to have had a, a real mentor. That would It's been- crucial. And I think like when you look at the studio tour, if you go and watch that, that segment on the YouTube channel that we just did with John, when he walks through his studio, there's no insecurity in the way that gear is laid out. Every gear has purpose. Mike Preezer over near this thing because it goes through this and this is my, you know, he's made decisions. Part of my real, my big problem is, with, you know, on that Dropping Daylight record, when I mixed that stuff, David Bendith produced it. And those, those songs had 108 to 120 tracks on each of them. We're talking eight kick drums, different snare drums, DIs. You know, part of me is just like, make a decision. Your producer, make the print what you think, and then I'll interpret what you think, you know? But it's like when I look at your studio, it tells me this guy has a concept. He knows how he sees the world. He knows what he wants his pianos to be. He knows well, what he wants you. his drums that, to that's, be. That's, I mean, that's a compliment. I got to say another reason for, and, I, and I'm a commitment guy for sure. Yep. And that's because I grew up with a 24 track. And, um, you know, from 92 to 2000, when I really cut my teeth, I wasn't using, I was using computers for sequencing and MIDI, but not for recording. So I met my first in the box record was probably 2001. And it's called Iffy by Bayada Bondo, if anyone wants to hear it, but completely recorded and mixed in the box. But everything before that was like tape, tape, tape. So you got 23 tracks and Simpty and you got to get it all on there. Yep. So Tambourine is sharing the bridge synth track 21 yeah. And the background vocal on the outro. And you got to figure out how to make all that fit and not erase it. And, you know, it, having done that for, for in my 20s really helped me, you know, 
like whenever I see, I, I mean, I mix a lot of other people's records too. And I mean, nothing more annoying than getting a 57 and a Royer on the same freaking guitar track. Just pick a sound. It's like, I got to have a choice. Just make me the choice. The DI really I, gets me. I, it's I to like, be honest, dude, nine out of 10 of those, I erase one of them. I just get rid oh, yeah. of it and I pick one. I'm not going to like make a subgroup and check the phase and just pick the, the freaking mic the, that That's good. the beautiful thing about getting these old like two inch machine. Uh, you, you know, in New York, I, I had access to the brain salad, the ELP brain salad surgery, 16 track on two inches. When you brought up the faders, it was kick drum, stereo drums, and then everything else. And it was like effects printed. It was done. It was right. essentially mixed. You were just like, the mix was like a, a bonus ad at that point because they were used to just getting what they got. But there was a yeah. beauty in, in the closure of it. But to go back, I just want to re reiterate this because I think the people that watch this program, if they're like I was, I was so desperate and searching for wondering what my life would be like, how I would get there, what the big breaks were, what the magic tickets were. And the magic, I think the takeaway from this discussion is find somebody that you really respect their work. Like when I listened to your mixes of the Dropping Daylight stuff, I was inspired by them. If I lived in Minneapolis, I would be like, where is this guy? How do I get in his studio? How do I get on his radar? Let me sit in and clean up after your session. Let me get coffee and bring pencils. Let me do whatever until I can be of value. Like that's the way. Study under a John Fields for a year. Be, bring great value to his life. Make his life easier. And then next thing you know, John's going to say, "Hey, can you do this vocal for me? Can you do take care of this while I'm doing that?" The next thing you know, you've got a worldview because you've seen John Fields make records. And just like John learned from, like he learned from his uncle, he learned all that stuff. But then he lived with it and baked with it for twenty years. And it became yeah, that's, that's that's the thing is the, is you gotta. I mean, I know I was shit at it. I just I, it was it was terrible. I mean, my music was bad. My recordings were bad. Everything was bad uh, back then. And but but he made me learn op code with my jam box and my Lin 9000 and my DX7 2 and, uh, you know, how to do MIDI and how to sequence and how to quantize and just how to right. like build a track. And at that point, literally, I'm listening to like Scritty Politi and Bobby Brown and L.A. and Babyface and Jam and Lewis and Prince, of course, we're in Minneapolis. Yeah. I mean, he's the king. And I'm just trying to figure out how do I do that? How do I make that sound? And and it was hard. And I and and, and but but here's the main thing. I went to the studio every day and I, st I stayed there for 12 hours a day. Being, you know, just figuring it out and being excited by just probably what was pretty bad music well but th that's the basis of it though it's like for instance if you call it a worldview you know that on earth we have gravity you know that water gets you wet you know these rules and you learned those from your uncle and you had to sort of slop around in them for a period until you found your thing but you knew the rules the rules of the universe people don't get that off of youtube now. right and if they can find a guy this is how you become uh in 12 hours in the studio is nothing because you love it it's not yeah. it's not doing push-ups. You're not sitting there doing push-ups and pull-ups all days. This is you love being there. So you're it was end for up. me, it was it was studio day gigs at night. And and the live playing really informed the the studio stuff and also introduced me to so many people in my town. And I had the the studio that you could, you know, I could bring my friends over and record their record or make a new song and didn't have to charge them. Or I think at one point it was 10 bucks an hour or something like that. Uh I made, but I also made like reggae records, jam band records. I mean, you know, remember like early 90s, big right. jam band scene. I would make a record in three days with a jam band. And, you know, these are sometimes great musicians, sometimes B and C musicians. But that was another thing that I learned uh, by being maybe also in a in a in like a in a town like Minneapolis, not like a Nashville or a New York or an L.A. is that um you just you kind of take the gigs that come and uh, it's like a it's just. You end up making records with bands that that are very successful locally that maybe don't have a global uh, a, a country, a national outreach, a national reach. And, um, you know, they're big in Minneapolis, but nobody's heard of them anywhere else. Yeah. And so I made a ton of those records 
And that really taught me how to do it. And that's in, and, and when I ended up getting, you know, more major label gigs and so forth that, you know, not every band's from LA or Nashville, but, but most of them aren't, to be honest. But um, when you end up working with a band that's been together since high school, you know, they're not always the best musicians. They're, they're, they've only played with each other. They never played in cover bands, but they got signed and now they're there and now they're working with this producer. So I felt yeah. like one of the, the best, you know, things that I had going for me was that I had already worked with a ton of musicians and I, I didn't have to like sub out the bass player for somebody better or get a pro. I would work with the guy in the band until we got That's it right. Point. And that takes a little longer. And, but you know, I was never a guy. I've never done it. Replaced someone on a record, gotten a pro drummer instead of the band's drummer. I never did it. So, dude, that's a great point. You know, the, the blessing of a secondary market is that you grow a muscle that can turn an average band in the right situation into a great band through mixing prowess and production, right? In engineering, there's a muscle yeah. that a lot of guys like when you're out in LA working at a big studio with all top guys. Like you're on this, you know, the this record you just did in L.A. that Tim Pierce stopped. Who was that with Ben? Um... That was Ben Rector. OK, so you've got like some pretty stellar players on that record. So, you know, it's almost I don't want to say it's ever easy, but it makes the producer and engineer's job so much easier when you got a guy like Bukovac playing guitar parts. They sound so good. I mean, well, you put a 57 in front of the amp and you hit record. Yeah. But if you're in a secondary market, you actually now have a muscle that a guy who started in New York or LA maybe doesn't have. Cause well, you know how okay. to pull things it's, out it's, of a toilet. It's that a tuning. Bit. It's that like, uh, you know, I pick up the guitar, I play a C chord. It's in tune, hand it back to the guy in the band. He plays the C chord. It's out of tune. I don't know what happened. I mean, is it the fingers? Is it so you're like tuning, you're punching in sections, you're, you're, you're holding, you're muting strings on the bass. So they're not humming. So, yeah. You know, you're literally I mean, I'm, I, I still do it. I still do it. It's you know, but I want that artist to feel like, you know, I don't want to be like, hey, I could do that better. I'll just uh, hey, give me that every bass. great producer can scale And you can. There's guys that grew up in, in primary markets that never had to scale because the musicianship was so good and so right. together that. Now, that said, Joe, when I do go and work with super pro musicians, it is a joy. It is a joy, especially like like I love Bukovac and Ilya Tashinsky, you know, like yeah. th those two dudes are incredible freaks. Incredible. I mean, Ilya freaks. just blows my mind every single time. And it's just yeah. like when you think there's no room for another part, you know, <laughs> you're like, it. it was actually the way I met Ilya was through Billy Ray Cyrus. We had done a song together and he's and it had a little country tinge to it, but, you know, it didn't have. It was, you know, didn't have banjo or mandolin on it. And he said, I got this guy in Nashville. We should get to play banjo and mandolin. His name is Ilya. Oh, OK. Send it to him. Get. And I thought the song was done. Right. Get the song back. Mandolin pan left. Banjo pan right. Incredible. Made the song. Yeah. Those parts were not there. Right. And now they're like the centerpiece of right. the song. And I realized at that point, wow. We get every once in a while, I get sucked into a situation where I'm in a, a room with, you know, I'm back at being 22 with a bunch of lousy uh, subpar musicians. We'll call them. I don't want to call them lousy. Right. But and I realize how hard it, I got to work. And I realize how blessed I am to have like, you know, hey, every day I get to have these guys running through the studio. But it's really a blessing. If you're in a secondary market, and you're struggling with these folks. This is an opportunity for you to be able to scale later when you become a big time producer, or a producer in a major market on big records. If the need calls you to go in and do something extraordinary, you have the, the experience from being in the secondary market. There's nothing you haven't seen. That's part of being a great producer. Right. I also think, you know, it's like no, no, no band guy wants to be replaced and sit there and watch some other guy drum on their record. I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. but also, what a deflating experience. Also yeah. a uniqueness that comes with maybe somebody's not so great. I mean, think of think of if the replacements were all studio musicians. Yeah. Think, that's we're using in Minneapolis. Yeah. That's one of my favorite bands of all time. That would suck, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's Kurt Cobain wouldn't be playing acoustic guitar on his records, you know? Right. Well, I mean, so that's, that's, I think part coming up, you know, just taking any project that comes your way. If you have a studio, I mean, if, yeah. if at this point you're like in your basement studio or whatever, just, just take anything that comes your way and, and work on it and do it and learn all the genres. And like, I'm, I mean, I'm not like, some like heavy metal guy or anything, but I understand it. And and 
when the Andrew WK album came my way, I grabbed it, took it and, you know, I kind of I figured out, OK, we're going to layer this a lot with drop tuning and, you know, you just get into it and you learn how to do it as it's happening. And I think just if you can get all the genres or just just, you know, I think it really just helps with all the other genres. It's like I think it's you need to be well rounded. You can't just be the guy who just does pop or just does top 40 music. You should be doing all of it. I was telling Mike, it's really cool that you, you know, you've got all these pop acts, but then it's like switch foot. It's like that's not totally normal, you know, to have guys having high profile records that are really, really big rock records, right? And aggressive records and then doing pop stuff. What what do you is that just your like your musicality? Is it just you as what you like? I, what I mean, do you attribute I, that to? I don't know. I mean, wh- why? Well, why Switchfoot is is just so heavy. Sold a lot is because to... they're amazing. <laughs> it's because because the but songs why are, are amazing. you doing it? Why oh, don't well, they, they use some they guy took... that just does that? I mean, I can tell you why the the I met the manager of Switchfoot. He said, hey, I've got this band I manage. I think you do a great job with them. Do you want to meet them? I said, yeah. We're, we're playing at SIR for a showcase tomorrow night. This is I had just moved to L.A. 2002 and I go down to this SIR showcase where they're playing a three song set in front of bidding war record companies in L.A. And I see them play. And afterwards I meet them and they say, oh, so we're going to do this. Right. And I said, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> and I booked a studio for the following Monday, which is Sage and Sound, uh, the small room there. And we started the record and they drove up from San Diego. And honestly, I'm not sure that they knew anything about me. They wow. took a shot because their manager said, you should work with this guy. And, and I said, let's do it. And I really didn't know about them. I'd heard the name. And the first song, first day was Meant to Live, which ended up being the super rock I love song. That. And uh, first day we were done. You know, end of the first day. I, mean, I just found the rough mixes from it, actually. They're about to play on Thursday, the 25th of February. They're playing that album uh, they've been doing live streams and they're playing it on uh, Thursday. So I'm very psyched to see that. But um, it, that record kind of turned around my whole trajectory and just, but I didn't see it coming. And uh, at that point, there was a lot of what I call drop D bands, you know, around. um, And I had worked with a bunch. I worked with a a Chicago band called, dovetail joint before that was signed and Great that year. was like this and i you know kind of gone through the school of like tight doubled rock drop d powerful choruses you know none of my keyboard tomfoolery that i usually add or it wasn't about pop stuff it was just about being tight in tune and making the vocal pop and be in front and a yeah. lot of these bands also have like harmony issues and that I always had for some reason. I just knew what the harmony was supposed to be. And it wasn't, you know. See, that's a great point because you're a great engineer. You're a great mixer. You're a standalone mixer. Great songwriter. Great record producer. Right? Great musician. But it's like you're kind of like anything you need to do, you can do at a high level. It's really like you're a Swiss army knife of going. If you send people into a room with John Fields to make a record, there's a high degree of success that is probable because you can fill any of those gaps and sort of have a good opinion about, Hey, this is your music, but what if you thought of it this way? Or what if, what about this decision? You're able to walk them through that process and have an outcome that's successful. I mean, I guess so, but I also know when they don't want that help (laughs) and when to just sit aside and let it happen. Huge. And you can tell when you start making suggestions and they don't like them. Yeah. I mean, it's weird, but it's definitely has happened. <laughs> right. You know, and it's like a taste thing or, you know, it's just just for whatever reason, I start putting like my super direct, super compressed, you know, strat doubled <laughs> Steve Lukather strats on. And they're like, <laughs> no, no, you know, and like, OK. And then you start realizing be careful what you suggest at this point or just let let them work out what they want to do. And um, so sometimes people want, you know, like I've, I've had experiences where like bands don't want to hear any reference to any other artist. Don't say Led Zeppelin. Don't say Beatles drum sound. Don't say, you know, don't say those things. They kind of ruin the vibe. So I I learn and I don't say those things. And then other bands thoroughly enjoy the reference game. Let's listen to Peter Gabriel right now and make that, you know, so I and you just have to be, be willing is, to do both. 
this is a super huge concept here that, that most people, they're so desperate when they get into a room, they want to prove themselves. I've got to, I've got to have some value. I've got to show these people my value. But sometimes, you know, the maturity of a producer like you is to say, hey, I'm just going to chill. I'm going to pull back. And whatever happens, I'll be able to help create. That's a super, that's overlooked. People, um, it goes against human nature. It goes against ego. It goes against insecurity. That's a big, big thing that takes a long time to learn. But when you can learn that, then you really are able to fit any void in the room. And if you've got the, if you've got the, the years of experience, you're confident that you can do that. Well, I guess so. But, you know, that doesn't mean I'm, you know, always happy with, with the trajectory of my career or anything like that. Cause you know, as we're freelance, so it's like, you don't really have control of what, what comes and, you know, I'm not like turning down Radiohead and Coldplay offers all day long. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy with what I have. I'm, I'm not saying I'm this is not. a great just, point. I had a hit songwriter buddy of mine who was, he was, we were somewhere and somebody, a new songwriter came up to him and they were just, just like so impressed to meet my buddy who was a hit songwriter. And, and he turned around to me and he said, you know, he referenced another hit songwriter that was bigger than him. And he said, if that guy had my career, the bigger songwriter, he would jump off a building, you know, and right. you just see like the relative perspective. Yeah, of, it's, like it's you do play that game in your in your your mind. You know, you look at at uh, occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll hear a great song and I'm like, who made that record? And, you know, inevitably it might be some friend of mine that I never knew yeah. about that. He did this record in England or something. And it's cool. You call that guy you're like, dude, I just heard that. That's amazing. You know, so. Um, but yeah, there's there's, you know, coming up, there was always I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it competition or jealousy, but there's like this thing of like, I wish I wish I got in there. If I could just get in there, like I've always wanted to make a record with XTC, one of my favorite bands, you know, and it's just, you know, it's like, but then be careful what you wish for is the other thing, right. you know, six months later, you're, you know, well, yeah, then you're like, what is it really like watching the paint dry in there? You know, is it is it? <laughs> So and I've always been like a fast record maker. I just can't stand sitting around. I mean, right. I, I don't take a lot of time. Day a song for me, maybe day and a half if you're, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, you start re rethinking everything you thought. Yeah. And or, you know, sometimes it's, you know, if it's if the artist is that way, then I have to go with it. Right. But um, usually it's as fast as possible. So when you're doing these songs, it's like, OK, you're creating. And then are you starting to mix while you're tracking the yes. vocals like it's happening ha and then yeah when you go i would to say mix, by the end of the day there yeah by the end of the first you're start, you know starting from scratch click track to you know 8 p.m it's i would say the generally speaking the artist goes home with what sounds like 90 percent of their record you yeah. know i mean I'm, I'm even quickly i mean i have some template stuff like everyone does but you know quick ways to like fatten up the kick with a sample or uh effects for the chorus vocals or you know certain delay throws are all kind of set so i can just quickly do that stuff i mean even in five minutes at the at the end of the day i can just quickly tweak up the mix jam on a couple master fader plugins make a bounce put it on dropbox and they're going to be stoked and then when they come back in the morning we you know we, we fix notes for an hour first hour fix the notes and then generally speaking it's move on to the next tune yeah. And just kind of do that for five days in a row. And I like to, I don't like to work more than five straight. Have you ever had this? Um, I had an inclination that I wanted to write the record. Then I wanted to produce and record the record. Then I wanted to mix the record. Then <laughs> I wanted to move on to the next record. But then I found out. Sounds horrible. Jeff. It's like that, <laughs> like my body wanted to do that. But then uh, I found out it's just not possible. I'm always writing. I'm always producing. I'll throw a bridge into a into a song while it's being mixed. Oh yeah. You know, there's it leaves you like let's say like people listen to your record. Like I listened to your dropping daylight mixes and was so envious. Just thought, man, this thing sounds so good. I imagine in my mind's eye, I imagine you sitting down, starting a song a day, starting off with a kick drum. But it's not that way, really. You're telling me it's like you're kind of just doing this. There's not that point where you're right. That developed you know, over time. I mean, I would say, you know, that and I didn't really perfect my pro tooling concept till, uh, you know, I, as I said, I started like fully in the box in 2001. And it like my my brain had to make a shift about analog versus digital in that I used to think of 
Pro Tools as like, you know, you'd cut your song on a 24 track two inch and, you know, your basics and all that. And then you'd make a rough mix and put it into Pro Tools and then you would do the vocals in Pro Tools. And at the end of the day, you'd finish the vocal, you'd comp it and then you'd print it back to the to the 24 track tape, like as if that's the final resting place. That shift for me never didn't take place. I remember I was making a record with Semisonic. It was called uh, Chemistry. I think it was their third record. And their drummer, Jake Schlichter, was the first guy that ever said to me, oh, just make a rough mix, put it in Pro Tools. I'll do some stuff at home and then we'll just fly it, fly it back. And I'm like, I didn't even get it. Like that concept of like that everyone's digital Pro Tools rig is the same. So you don't have to worry about Simpty or this right. or that. It's just like once it's there, it's there. And I just my it blew my mind like, oh, my God, anyone can just do any overdub and send it to me and I can just put it there. It's not about tape final resting place. And then we're going to, you know, bring that tape to JJP to mix or something like that. It's this is the this computer is the final. And once I've got that shift in my brain, that's that's when I started realizing the power of Pro Tools and and just the ability to work fast and multiple projects in the same day and kind of all, all, all of that, you know, and templates and just getting getting fast at something. Right. Uh, engineering, which used to be a slower thing when we were in the analog world. Yeah. And so when you went away from consoles, you're saying that's around 01. Is that like, you know, there's a nostalgia. Everybody wants a profile picture with a nice console behind them. I mean, it's just like, it's almost like an old Polaroid picture. It's just, I love the idea of it. <laughs> I remember I sold that console. We bought it for $30,000. What did you have, an AMAC? AMAC Einstein. Uh huh. I remember that desk. And it had a, an Atari 1040 ST uh, VCA style computer that would give us automation on mutes and volumes. And, uh, it was great. I mean, it was a console head. It was inline. So it had 64. It was 32 channel, but it had 64 EQs and 64, uh, 32 mic pre's with 64 EQs on, on, on mix. So, you know, but still it's an analog mix, even with automation, it's, it's an analog mix. I didn't have that many outboard stuff. I had like, I remember the very Mew was one of my first like big time. Ooh, that's gonna We're going to put that on the master mix. But before that, I never had any compression on my master bus. I didn't even know that you did that. Uncle Steve, <laughs> Never told me to do that because they didn't do that uh. on Funky Town. They did not put compressors on the mix. Maybe some people did. I know the Beatles did when they would bounce over between four track to four track. But that wasn't like, uh, you know, it was like the mastering guy would right. put the Fairchild on it. Right. That's why it sounds like that. So I never did that until I met this guy, Chuck Zwicky, who was another mentor for me, a local guy who had tons of knowledge. He was a bit older than me. And he was the first guy to say, tell me the things like under snare mic out of phase. And now it's going to be fat. Whoa. <laughs> uh, just things like just basic things. And then like stereo bus master master compression and parallel stuff that I didn't even nobody even said it. It was not in mix magazine. It, it just wasn't. It, it was, right. you know, delay compensation hadn't even been invented yet in Pro Tools. You couldn't even do it if you wanted to do wow. parallel compression. So, it, uh, you know, when I switched over in about 2001, and then I moved to L.A. in 2002, and I uh, couldn't bring the console with me or the tape deck, and I left it at, at my house here in Minneapolis. And uh, at the end of the day, I think we sold it for 500 bucks, wow. <laughs> the console. And I ended up selling a tape deck to a guy in L.A. right when I moved back to Minneapolis a few years ago. I think I told sold the tape deck for two grand. Oh, Lord. Otari MX-80. I had one of those. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah. Loved it. And I had the class system for a little while yeah. in L.A. And I brought it out there. And turns out that it, it was only as good as your tape deck is. So and I had an Otari MX-80 and not a suitor. So I was like, yeah, it's, I don't think it's better and worth the hassle. But anyways, so, yeah, I kept a lot of the gear. I mean, I, I have remorse sometimes that I sold some things like I can't believe I sold that jazz bass. I can't believe I sold that synth, you know, but, you know, it, you end up just, you know, with what you have. And when I got when I started making some more money from the from the records I was producing, I started buying dream, you know, uh, Desert Island gear. Like I've always wanted a Juno 60 and I never had one. So I'm like, I'm going to buy one on Craigslist. So and it was nice being in L.A. because 
there was just a lot of Craigslist ability, like kind of Nashville has the same thing. You go through Craigslist musician and uh, music gear in Nashville, and it's like unbelievable here right. in Minneapolis. It's kind of slim pickings. Yeah, I think that when you look around your studio and our studio tour that you see that all the stuff you kept was all the the right stuff. It was all the stuff that's like thumbprint stuff. You know, you'll do the Pro Tools stuff in the Pro Tools world where it's easier and better and more convenient. And then you'll send it out and you'll do this really funky thing with the TGI limiter, right? Because yeah, it's uh, a thing, yeah. like an analog thing. Like my thing on 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 did on on vintage gear, it's beautiful when you go to uh, you know, Blackbird and you have all the choices and all the 1073s and all that. But I don't need the 1073s. I mean, honestly, I would never spend that money on a pair of 1073 vintage, you know, in a boutique audio rack with some weird proprietary power supply that no one knows how to fix. You know, in Minneapolis, when I it have breaks. one of those. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. And they were the thing, you know, you know, at this point, I want like I kind of made a new a policy in the last five, 10 years where it's like I'm going to buy new gear by new companies that I really like that works. And then if they if they break or if there's a malfunction, you can send it back to Jeffrey Daking and he'll fix it. Right. Or, or Phoenix or, uh, you know, API is a company that exists. I mean, right. I guess Neve is a company. But it, it's, you know, to fix these weirdly uh, put together boutique audio racks. Yeah, the stuff. new Neve is not fixing old power, 24 volt right. power so, supplies from the 80s. And honestly, consoles. it's, you know, I, I just want gear that works. I mean, I know, yeah. look, it's not my Phoenix is not a 1073, but it sure sounds like one to me. And at the end of the day, I kind of don't care. And we were, you know, talking about that Phil Collins thing where it's like you watch the making of the Mama album with Hugh Padgham. And Phil is singing into an M88 in, the, in their right. billion dollar studio. He's singing into a $250 mic. Yeah. And it shows you that it doesn't matter. It's because Phil's singing. Yeah. And, you know, yes, I have nice gear and I've collected some nice gear over the years. But at the end of the day, I don't need it to make the records. I mean, I'd it's be a happy brilliant. with an Audio Technica mic it's, for the lead vocal if we needed it. If that's all a, we had. Yeah, it's a brilliant synopsis because it's like what you're not seeing here is like, yeah, it doesn't matter but it totally matters. There's things right. you'll I mean, die exactly. on a hill for, you know, but, yeah. it's, but it's the difference is you've got 30 years of doing it to know what it is you'll die on a hill for and what you won't. Some things it's like, there are no rules. Sometimes there are some rules and it's like yeah. the experience. And, and I, I reserve the right to change my mind at any point about <laughs> what's important. Well, you here's know? the good question then. What is the desert island gear in that studio, right? What is I mean, the for me, it's honestly the mastering lab tube mic pre that Doug Sachs made. There's only there's not that many out there. The reason that uh, it's JJP told me that they uh, if, if you know the, the Bill Schnee studio, if you ever heard of that or looked it up, it's in it's on Lancashire in Hollywood. Now it's part of the Larrabee complex, but it's the drum room that Jellyfish cut their two albums drums in. And there if you look at vintage pictures, vintage being, you know, early 90s, of that room, it looks like a spaceship, but there's rolling racks. There's two eight channel rolling racks of these mastering lab mic pre's right next to like the drum kit, like remote. They weren't remote mic pre's, but they were rather than having them in the in the control room with long XLR 200 foot runs. He would uh, Bill Schnee preferred to put uh, his drums with 10 foot mic cables to the mic pre and then a 200 foot line cable to the to the console. So and Jellyfish Spilt Milk is one of my favorite and most incredible records in my s sphere of listening. And uh, he always told me, if you ever see a Mastering Lab mic pre, buy it. And I did. And it changed my life. And I, wow. now I want, you know, now 15 go more, but out. I can't get them. I've never even heard of it. Where do you, they're nowhere to be found, you're saying? There's a couple on eBay right now. And they're, you know, it's it's a tube mic pre. And there's only one guy that knows how to fix it. And that's Toby Foster in L.A. And if anyone else... I mean, there's probably some other people that know how, but Toby Foster was part of that team. Um, Doug Sachs, Bill Schnee. He was Toby Foster was the tech at Bill Schnee studio. And he, so he knows. And, and so when I bought mine, it was wrong. I, I hooked it up and I was like, this sounds weird. This is not good. And I asked around and they said, bring it to Toby Foster. And he's like, oh, you need this. You need this cap changes and changed it all. It was like a $87 repair. And it was the most I remember hooking it up on this singer, the first person that sang on it was her name was Bonnie Anderson from Australia. And I just was like, oh, <laughs> all right. Tell I me cannot believe this is happening. 
And at was, that point, I had been using API, which I love. Was love that the API. one the one rack? Yes, yeah, a one rack space. That's a tube ML1. mic pre. The mic pre, very simple. It's That's tube, a tube. Though. Yeah, the tube lives inside that one space. Yeah. Twelve AX seven kind of tube. I don't know, <laughs> honestly. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, what's it's give incredible. me the name one more time because I'm about. To I think it's the Mastering it. Lab mic pre ML one. ML one master level. Like so three. there's not a. I don't even think there's an ML two. I'm going to go have, buy it before this ep this episode. Airs, um, Joe, so they can, have two at at Blackbird. McBride has uh, the. Of course he does. He has two versions. The one with the white panel is my favorite. He has the black panel also, which is like the uh, beta early version, I think. But it doesn't have the same switches, and it didn't sound the same to me. But he does have the other one, and you should try that out. You it's have the white cool. one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and those. And you can see those in, in those uh, Bill Schnee pictures and JJP. That's why, well, you know, he told me 16 tracks of tube Mike Pre on spilt milk. And, you know, if you, if you don't know the record spilt milk, jellyfish jellyfish, record uh, you probably should listen to it. Um, yeah, that was a record that when it came out, people found you and they were like, you got to listen to this record. My friend Jimmy Koo had a thing called it's a money back guarantee. Yeah. Go buy the jellyfish spilt milk album. If you don't like it, I'll buy it from you. That was his wow. money back guarantee. Go buy the CD. And if you don't like it, I'll pay you back. That's and I'll do guarantee. that to this day. About yeah, that it's record. a great record. But it was funny that when that record came out in 92, I had uh, just been their first record was 90. And so I was at the right age. I was, you know, early 20s. And those guys were a little bit older than me, but they were doing it. They, it was Michael Penn who kind of brought back the Beatle thing in 80. It was like 87 or 86 was No Myth that came out. That Tony Berg produced and it had all those awesome Mellotrons on it. But, uh, you know, think about it. Other songs at that time were like Cutting Crew and like MIDI, you know, the Dan Reed Network and stuff like that with like full on, you know, MIDI, not Beatle stuff. And then the Rembrandts came out with Just the Way It Is Baby, which was uh, yeah, a Whirly based song. And, and I ended up doing their third and fourth records because one of the guys is from Minneapolis and and I remember loving that record and then Crowded House and then uh, XTC made Skylarking in 86, which is the the that is the holy grail record of all Todd Rundgren produced. But um, that kind of that scene of, you know, it was the Grays. It was Jellyfish. It was Crowded House. It was Rembrandt's. It was uh, just those kind of earthy anti midi records that kind of brought me back into got me away from trying to make like, you know, the Elian baby face, Bobby Brown sounding music yeah. and got me into like back into my pure, my real roots, which are Beatles. And that stuck, you know, the Mellotrons, the Leslie's, the compression, the live drums, the snare drums, the Ludwigs. And uh, that said, I didn't drop all my funk. I had all that. I ended up starting a funk band and, you know, doing because we lived in Minneapolis. So you, you had to there was a Prince thing that always had to be going on. And so we had that going on with my band Greasy Meal. But at the time, I just wanted to make that Jellyfish record over and over. And uh, I think I did a couple of times. Wasn't Jason Faulkner in the Grace? He was. Yeah. And and um, and and John Bryan and Dan McCarroll and Buddy Judge were the were the Grays. All right, before we let you go, real quick, can you tell us uh, how heavily you process when you're mixing a record? How heavily are you processing your two bus mix? And what are some of the the gags you're doing on your two bus if that's where you're getting a, a, a large part of your sound from? I mean, it's not really a secret because I, 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 at one point, one of my favorite mixers is Chad Blake. And uh, if you listen to, you know, and, and honestly, the records that are really important to me by him are all analog um, that he did at Sunset Sound Factory, like Soul Coughing, Suzanne Vega, 99, uh, sorry, Nine Objects of Desire. And uh, I follow him and what he has to say a lot. And he once mentioned that the ML4000 McDSP multiband compressor was one of his favorite compressors to put on a two bus and I just tried it and I loved it. And that's been sitting there for forever. Yeah. Um, I'd say that's a little secret. How you said it, that's another whole story, but cause there's so many buttons and craziness on there. Yeah. But it does this thing where it kind of like eats up 
the the crappy low end that you don't want brightens up. It's kind of like a smiley face maker. Yeah. But um, like a broadcast limiter would be. Yeah. Like kind of like a cheater vibe where you're like, oh, that's terrible. Then you turn that thing on. It's oh, much better. But other than that's the normal stuff, you know, treble. <laughs> Those are my favorite. You know, uh, lately compression, you know, I'll go between multitudes of bus compressors that everyone has. Are uh, you limiting your much. two mix? Uh, only for client at the end, right. I'll have like a I use the boss limiter at the end just just to make it loud. But but then no. Um, and are you um, mastering a lot of stuff yourself just out of necessity or are you no. usually sending out? Very rare that that happens. I use uh whoever the client wants to go with, if the band wants to use a mastering or I, I like, I like lots of mastering engineers. Yeah. I don't really have a preference or anything, but um, I just want, I mean, my only rule with mastering is just, just don't make it worse, please. Right. That, that's all I ask. So, God forbid your mastering engineer is a bass player. Cause yeah. then you know, you get that bass heavy mix back. Exactly. But you know, I, but I've worked with them all and uh, I've had great experiences with them all and very few bad experiences. But yeah. I'm not like a crazy tweaker about, you know, I, I just that's I, an art in of itself. Learning when yeah, to let I go. let things go. I can let it go. Like right. it's, it's, it's like, I mean, I've had the artist call me back and say, don't you hear the difference? And I say, not really. And they go, come on, can't you tell? It's kind of like the, the percussions gotten flattened out a little bit. And I'm like, I don't really hear that. But, you know. The other thing is, you know, maybe just after years of gigging and studios is, my, you know, my high end is probably compromised. I haven't had a test, but I'm assuming it's, you know, I always have to ask the younger people in the room, is that tambourine too loud? <laughs> uh, and they go, yeah, turn that down a little bit. <laughs> but so it could be that. But also I just like letting it go. And, you know, like I like having another professional take it from here. Yeah, like, that's in the a mastering point. thing. It's a great point. So, like, Sometimes... I've been working on a. Uh, there's a Tom Lord Algae is is currently mixing a song like this last week, and I we just got the mix back, and it's great. And I asked him, "Do you have like a client limiter on there?" He says, "No, I don't do that. I just this is it. This is what we're going to send to mastering. This is what I send to you, and it's just he makes it even simpler. Yeah. So it made it kind of made me think I should just do that. <laughs> yeah that's but it's too but then they listen next to their favorite record it's and it's eight db quieter and you're like they're like why is it yeah. so weak <laughs> turn it up this is like all the spinal tap isms of our profession <laughs> yeah. you know it's like you just have to laugh when you hear someone else talking about all the challenges that you get on a daily basis yeah. it's like are we gonna have this conversation am i gonna have this conversation for the billionth time yeah and how am i gonna well, make it interesting for myself but at the end of the day you know you do you end up doing it because you just you know you it's funny i always get it back from mastering and i always go how do they get it that loud what right there's like i could if i made it that loud it would t sound it'd fall like apart crunchy and terrible and a, they, is there a secret box i don't have or what's right. the deal or so well, you know, I, i'd back, rather just not know bat you were talking about how like it wasn't these these this topic you were talking about um i don't know what it was but you were saying like you, they didn't talk about it in mixed magazine they didn't talk about it two bus compression i think you were talking about yeah that. and and there was an era where you went into the control room and the engineers were kind of like they didn't want you looking at stuff. There was yeah. there was this thing where people information wasn't free sh freely shared as it is today. I mean, you go on YouTube now and anyone will show you just about anything. So that's that's sure. a beautiful thing. I and do remember uh, that first mix I did, uh, and the reason I, I like I made a record in '97, one of my first major label records. It's called Tina and the B Sides, uh, all just the same. And I tracked and produced the record here in Minneapolis. And then they said who do you want to mix? And I said, well, I thought I do. And they said, no, you can hire, we can hire anyone you want. Who are you interested in? And I remember asking about Jack Joseph Puig and cause he had done the jellyfish records. And I was like, let's get that guy. So I went and worked with Jack on that record. And I was in that studio that you've all seen that those, you know, ocean one. Yeah. Uh, it's just insane. And I remember looking around at just all the gear and kind of watching everything. And, and I was just like, this is crazy. Like I'm literally, I had a DBX 166 at home, and a Van Manly Vary Mew. More and and <laughs> you know, and this and and I'm watching what's happening. I'm like, and I and I sponge it up to be honest. Yeah, you know. So well, hey, um, we want to thank you for doing that today with us, being so forthright and open about all things from you know just your philosophy and 
your execution, your studio. It's really good to be able to look into the lives. It's been a, me and Mike talk about all the time. What a great time we have doing this podcast. We're coming up on our hundredth episode. And wow, that's and great. It's so much fun because it's a valuable resource for folks. We try to distill it down for people that were the versions of us 20, 30 years ago. But we also, we get a kick out of it. I love getting to hang with you for an hour. We, I've known of you for 20, 30 years and admired your work. And it's like we get to sit down and hang out with you and Tony Platt and the long, Reed Shipman and a long list of people we've been able to do this with and see like we don't usually get to get into a room. It's like right because we're I, yeah. We're, different role we're the same role and so every project your studio is totally cool man i'm I'm just jealous of that barn what an incredible space well, come on down to nashville and we'll do uh, one of these episodes live in the i barn. will be i'll be there at some point soon <laughs> once this we get out of this deal yeah man well thank you so much for coming on and thanks like for having me so forth right jim shack thank you john Joe. Thank you, great to see you, you guys all right pal that's it this week for the west barn we're signing off we'll see you next time 